our speaker really needs no introduction, but I'm going to give you a little context. Um, how many of you are seniors? Seniors. Remember what happened during spring break three years ago? Right? The whole world went sideways. Well, guess who preached just before the world went sideways? Bill. All right? So we're going to let, we're going to, we waited three years, but we're going to let Bill preach and just hope for better results. Uh, but, uh, you know, Bill is, Bill is my colleague. Um, Bill is my friend. Bill has a heart for God. And Bill knows how to make this thing do special things. So will you join me in welcoming Bill Mooney McCoy. I will. Are we all set with this, Aaron? Hang on a sec, folks. All right. Please stand by. Okay, there we go. Okay. Good morning. I want to first of all apologize for the heat. It wasn't my idea. Um, so I'm sorry about it if it's a little warm in here. I, I realize that it has been three years since I've been in this pulpit uh, for you guys. And some of you may not really know who I am. You see me play a lot of music. That's kind of something I do. Um, but there's a little bit more, just a little bit more to me than that. Um, I thank God that I was raised in a wonderful Christian home uh, by two amazing parents. And for those who are wondering, yes, my dad is black and my mom is white, and that's a whole nother talk show that someday I may share with you guys. I have a sister, and I'll talk a little bit more about her as well. Uh, and yes, I did rock an enormous afro. It used to take me 10 minutes to lie down at night. It was just terrible. Um, I grew up in the Codman Square neighborhood of Dorchester which is part of Boston, um, went to Boston Latin School, uh, which was the first public school in America, and we think some of the original teachers were still there. Uh, <laughs> went to Brandeis, uh, which was a predominantly Jewish university, and then I got my master's degree in jazz piano at New England Conservatory, all of which is not that important. What is important is that I've been married to a wonderful woman, Paulia, for 42 years. We live in a gorgeous 10-room Victorian in the same Codman Square area that I grew up in. And by God's grace, we have raised three kids. Caleb, who you saw last fall. Uh, Ethan and his wife, Rachel, who now live in Quincy. And my daughter, Niasha, who is a first grade teacher in Baltimore. In addition, believe it or not, I have two grandchildren, Faith and Desi. And a cat named Izzy, who helped me prepare this sermon. Um, in terms of what I've done with my life, I've had a bunch of jobs, like a lot of jobs. Some were one-offs, some I'm still doing. Uh, and yeah, I've done some stuff. You can ask me about that if you want, but I will say to you without question, my favorite job by far is the job I get to do with you all here, where I lead you all in the worship of our Lord Jesus Christ with all kinds of cool stuff, and I get to work with the coolest student leaders on earth. And for this, I am grateful, and I'm happy to do all this cool stuff, but the best part of my job is when I get to sit down one-on-one -on -one with some of you and get to know your story and share mine. That's my favorite part of my job. So feel free, if you want, when you get back from break, um, to make an appointment with me, because I've got the comf most comfortable couch on campus. Is, can anybody testify? And I just love getting to know you and maybe sharing our stories together. All right. So our passage today is from Philippians. Um, and it's this scripture that says, In your relationships with one another, have the mindset of Christ Jesus. And as I thought of that, um, it was very clear to me that there's a song, a hymn, that speaks so vibrantly for this. It's, this might be my favorite hymn. I'm not sure. It's definitely up there. What I love about May the Mind of Christ My Savior is that each verse 
This focuses on one thing. On, his, on the mind of Christ, the word of God, the peace of the Father, the love of Jesus, the race before me, and his beauty. And so, I'm going to share that with you now. As I seek the lost to win that they may forget this channel, sing only Back to our text. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. The same attitude. The same context. Um, so I did a little bit of Strong's concordance on this. I don't usually do this, but I kind of felt like I needed to get a little bit Greek on it. And apparently, the verb form used is a present passive imperative third person singular. Linguistics majors are going nuts saying you're speaking my language. And I thought about the fact that this was passive. What that implies is that something is being done to us. It is not, let me become like Christ. I'm going to do it right now. Nah. Nah. <laughs> It is more that I need to put myself in a position. I need to be able to receive that. 
I need to, um, to be receptive to that. And the song I just sang, May the Mind, is a, is a prayer. It's, it's, a, it's a hope. It's an aspiration. But it's not something I can force. I can't force myself to have the mind of Christ because I'm me. <laughs> um, one of the things when it happens when you get married is you kind of begin to love the things that your spouse loves. And so my wife, Paulia, has always been a lifelong trekker. And um, I've become someone who knows that universe. And in The Next Generation, there was a, 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 an episode where a character named Q, who had the gift of omnipotence, was trying to help them solve an enormous problem. I think an asteroid was going to destroy something or, you know, the usual stuff. And the solution, he said, was very easy. Just change the gravitational constant in the universe. Right. And you know what? I would say to you to become like Christ is about as easy as changing the gravitational constant of the universe. Are you feeling me? We just aren't there. We don't have the character depth to become like Christ. And so it's kind of hard because look at this, it's also an imperative, it's not a suggestion. And so I thought about this. It sounds contradictory. It's passive and imperative. How does that work? And I realized that what it is, well, it's kind of spoken out in verse 12 and 13 in the same passage where it says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you to will and to act to fulfill his purpose, his good purpose. See, what I realized is it's kind of similar to what the 12 steps have taught me. In step six and seven, we're entirely ready to have God remove all defects of character and then humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Folks, there's an intentionality here. No, I don't have the ability to make it happen, but I have the will to allow it to happen. Are you following me? And so that's what God is calling us to do here. So how do we do this thing about having the mind of Christ or the mindset? Well, I love verse 3 um, and 4, which says, um, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interests of others. That's the blueprint. I would submit to you there are three specific things that I drew out of this. Number one, to be humble. Number two, to be sacrificial. And number three, to be purposeful. Now, you may come up with some others, and that's cool. But these are the ones that God put on my heart, so let me jump into it. First of all, being humble. If you look in Romans 12, um, you see this passage. Don't cherish exaggerated ideas about yourself, of yourself or your importance, but try to have a sane estimate of your abilities in the light of the faith that God has given to all of you. I would submit that humility... Being humble also involves self-acceptance and self-awareness. Now, this is, this is kind of a, an interesting thing. Um, there is nothing humble about denying what God has enabled you to do. That is not being humble. There's nothing humble about saying, I can't do things. There is nothing humble about Angel Nook saying, I can't sing. That's not humble. That's just plain stupid. <laughs> Am I right? That is not humility. Humility is understanding what I can do, what I can't do, and being okay with it. I don't need to show off and put myself out there in a way that ex exalts me, but I do need to put myself out there in a way that glorifies God and, and, and helps us. It's not humility to withhold my gifts. See, Jesus knew who he was. He knew he was the Son of God. And out of that strength, he was able to choose to be humbled. It came out of the strength of knowing who he was. And that gave him the ability to endure. Now, quick tangent. 
one of the most important things we can do for each other is to encourage each other and to build each other up. When you see something in somebody that's a gift, that's a positive, you need to tell them. Old Saturday Night Skit, we are here to pump you up. <laughs> yeah, that's your job. Our job is to pump each other up and to help each other discover the things that we can do so that we can all be fully um, having the body of Christ function at its fullest capacity. <sighs> For me, this has been one of the best things about me working at Gordon. And in the music department, there's Dr. Kwok, Dr. Kim, Dr. Doneski, and Dr. Modoff, each of whom have single-handedly encouraged my musicianship. I cannot tell you how much that means to me, how much that's encouraged me. And that doesn't make me feel arrogant or blow me up. That humbles me. And it makes me dare to write that next string quartet arrangement or to attempt to tame the beast, that organ that we call the beast, and try to, to play a hymn. Because I've been encouraged. So let's do that with each other. But having said that, the second point would be sacrificial. What I mean by sacrificial, it means it's going to cost. It's going to be, it's going to take something from us. How many of you recognize this picture? Yeah, me too. I feel you. Somebody call out, what was that? Chapel outside, fall of 2020, spring of 2021, it was a situation. Several hundred white chairs spread apart by 12, 10 to 12 feet. Every single chapel, CTS had to set up from scratch every day. God bless them. One day... Before chapel, I noticed a man in gym shorts and a white t-shirt and a towel wiping down all of the chairs from the dew from the previous night. We're talking several hundred. And I couldn't figure out who that person was. I knew it wasn't a student. And I got closer, I realized it was President Lindsay. I don't know if I can think of a more apt expression of servanthood. out there with the towel. He knew who he was, but that wasn't above him, I mean beneath him. And so he had the towel and he was wiping the chairs so that your behind would not have a water stain when you left chapel. To me, that's word. I'll never forget that image. This is playing out in my personal life. This is a picture of my mom and my sister. And many of you know that I have been going through a very tough time. Even as I speak right now, my mother's being transferred from the emergency room into uh, her third rehab since October. Uh, and my sister is um, physically challenged, but even more cognitively challenged in a way that is severe. Um, and she's been living with us since October. And... <sighs> The English language doesn't have words that can describe how stressful it is that I could say in chapel. But it's been very hard. And I've had to sacrifice. My wife has had to sacrifice. It has cost us dearly. And we've had to serve her. Literally, we serve her meals. Literally, I have to lay out her clothes when uh, her caretaker doesn't come. Literally, we have to tell her where she's going, what time it is. And even last night, I had to tell her it's time to go to bed. I've been learning what it means to have the mind of Christ, and I've been learning very clearly how much of the mind of Christ I ain't got. <laughs> very clear to me. But in sacrifice, in servanthood, servant leadership, we gain the mind of Christ. And then finally, purposeful. Now, here's the thing. Jesus was obedient to death. He knew what his death was going to accomplish, and so he was going for it. He understood the greater purpose. But let me, let me backtrack a little bit. Being humble and sacrificial can be a little bit problematic for people of color because such 
scriptures have been used to keep us in our place. I would submit that's also been the case for women or any group that's on the wrong end of the power spectrum. So how do we suss this out? How do we actually look at the, how this becomes not abusive? And how do we know when it is time to deny myself my rights and when it isn't? Martin Luther King, who we celebrated a little while ago, was told by the white evangelical community, you're going too far too fast. The white evangelical community did not support him. Now we honor him. But he was not supported. How does this work? Well, here's what I'm going to submit. I would submit to our purpose. Here are our prime directives, he said, referencing Star Trek once more. To glorify God, to edify, unify, and purify the body of Christ, and to exemplify the kingdom of heaven to the world. That is our purpose. So, as I suss out how I should react to a situation, if it is going to fulfill those purposes, it may be time for me to stand up. It may be time for me to push back. When Rosa Parks said, nah, she was meeting those purposes, wasn't she? She was bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth, exemplifying it and glorifying God in the process. That was a place where it was right for her to stand up for her rights. And in fact, Jesus did this. When he cleared the temple out, he was doing all three, wasn't he? By clearing the temple out, and that was not a meek and mild moment, was it? Again, that's hard to balance, and you need prayer, and you need the Lord to tell you when to, to, to react. But I just wanted to acknowledge that there is a time to say, not today. So, thanks, Bill. Those are the three things that we're supposed to do. Great. So I'll go ahead and change the gravitational constant of the universe. How do we do this? I'm going to submit three suggestions. First of all, the first one is in connection. It's first of all in connection with Christ himself. Coffee with Jesus. <laughs> the more I hang out with my Lord through prayer, reading of his word, meditating, the more I'm going to be like him. We know that, but it's, we forget that, don't we? But the second thing is to be connected with people who exhibit the mind of Christ, people who are models, people who are mentors, people who, that dude, or that woman shows me Jesus, I'm going to be like that. Let me hang with them. The reason why I have this job is because of this man, my dad, who from the very beginning instilled a love and understanding of music in me. Every time I play a musical instrument, I am giving him honor. But not only did dad give that to me, but also my dad's character was one of the most Christ-like characters I know of. And so many ways, people have been able to say, I'm like my father. Because I got to spend my life with him. And I look forward to seeing him when my, day, my days here have ended and joining him in his heavenly reward. So, first connection. Who are you hanging out with? That will help you get the mindset of Christ. Secondly, in suffering. In hard times. Apparently, we grow through difficult times. Apparently. And I know Jesus loves me, so if he could find an easier way to make me grow, he would do that, but he can't. Um, there was a song by a group called The Winans. Very powerful group. Um, and they had a song that said, Gonna Be All Right. And one of the lines was, Heartaches will come, heartaches will go. That thing came out when my son Ethan was a little two-year-old, and he thought they were saying, hard eggs will come, and hard eggs will go. And that's become a, a running joke in my family. And the other day, Paulie and I were crying out to the Lord about some things, and I said, babe, 
we're going through some hard eggs. <laughs> and we broke up laughing for about five minutes. Some of you are going through some hard eggs right now. Some of you are going through some really hard times. And I just want to encourage you. It is going to be all right, and we will get through this. There's a song, Lord, help me to hold out until my changes come. And that's been my theme. It hurts, but it's how we get purified. I know where this is landing. I read the last chapter. I know where it's going. But right now, I'm in this meanwhile. And so I've been meanwhiling. You following me? And meanwhiling is hard. And usually God doesn't tell us when that will end. I suspect some of you are meanwhiling. And you've got some hard eggs. Finally, how do we become more like Christ? It takes time. Stevie Wonder said, it's taken us so long because we've got so far to come. Oh my gosh, yes we do. You know, I've been looking for the fast forward button in spiritual growth. It ain't there. <laughs> it ain't there. There isn't one. How long is it going to take till I become like Christ? As long as it takes. Sorry. I know that hurts. And apparently God needs me and my wife to grow through this challenge with my sister so that I can come through here purified as gold. Apparently that's what he needs. I'm not happy about it. But that's, that's what Christ has, has made clear to me. Folks, in our relationships with each other, we need to be humble, sacrificial, and purposeful. And that is how we will have the mind of Christ. My brothers, my sisters, my friends, let us love Christ, each other just like Christ has loved us. Father God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you. Y'all chill up there. Just chill. Just chill. I thank you, Lord God, that you want us to become like you. And I pray, Lord God, as we head to break, that we would look for opportunities to become more like you. Bless my friends. Keep us all safe as Bob has prayed. In Christ's name, amen. Y'all can bounce. <laughs>